Long, long ago, there was a land called Africa, or better yet, Alkebulan. Not only was she the birthplace of humans, but her people birthed great civilizations. Civilizations that were built from the wealth of her natural resources that she shared freely with her children. Over time, this wealth would begin to elude them, forcing her children to exchange a life of riches for poverty, a poverty that would remain until the day they remembered that Africa's wealth lay in Africa herself. This is Made in Africa, and today we seek to rebuild Africa's wealth through Africa's land. The year was 1000 AD. The continent was Africa, and she had just gone through a series of changes. In the north, the Islamic conquest of seven of her states was complete. Run to migration from west to south was well underway. The use of iron tools had begun to replace flint tools. And international trade routes began to link the continents. With the second largest landmass and a population well under 30 million inhabitants, Africa was a fountain of wealth for her children. With an almost limitless supply of gold, diamonds and silver, her heirs became some of the richest in the world. The first truly hashtag blessed generation, if you will. A platform where her children like Ntutuko Shezi could use his entrepreneurial skills to generate wealth through the use of her land for the benefit of us all. Everyone wants to belong somewhere, you know, like, um, I think it's, it's, it's the one thing that's, that's important, you know, where, where everyone has got to have a center, you know, and uh, there's no better connection to somewhere than, than ownership, you know, than, than land, you know. It's, it's, it's one of those things, it's therapeutic. I think as an African, you have one place where you always go back to. You, we've got the concept of Ukoduka, as the Tosas like to say. Um, you know, it's every long weekend, every uh, Christmas, every Easter holiday. We go home. This is my land, uh, so I own this land. So my uncle, uh, I had a favorite uncle. He passed away in 2006. And the last thing he did, two weeks before he died, was to cut me this piece of land. We've got that sense of a bigger, wider family. You know, there's no stepchild. Um, Africans are communal people. You cannot have a community without a place where the community gathers. The main thing is wealth uh, that we need to chase. Uh, it shouldn't just only be for the sentiment. It must be we own the production. We own what happens to the production after it's left the farm. Uh, we're making the profits all the way to the supermarket. So when you take away our land, you, you take away all of that, you take away the place where we can meet as a family. You take away the source of our income. You take away the store of our value. Um, but most importantly, you take away our history. There are several theories about the origins of the name Africa. One of which is that it is a word inspired by Latin meaning sunny land. However, years before this Latin name Africa, our continent was known as Alkebulan a name found in the records of the Moors, the Nubians, the Carthaginians, Ethiopians, and the Numidians. Alkebulan, meaning mother of humankind or garden of Eden. A garden that would not only be a great gift, but it would be a great responsibility as well, giving plenty to those who were willing to work. In fact, I'm always convinced Nkulunkuli is a farmer, and it truly is, because the only, all you do as a farmer is to create something from nothing and you make money out of it, you know, it's, it's, that's what I love about it. And um, that's why farming is really critical uh, in terms of, in terms of the basic, basic, most important method of creating wealth. Why is it that uh, most Africans are poor? Uh, and it's, and I always, it always came, came to me that the first thing that was always the backbone of the African economy has always been cattle. So if you read history books, <clears throat> like in, in Cape Town, within 20 years of 
of Jan van Riebeek arriving in Cape Town, all the cattle in the Cape belonged to the white man, no longer the black man. Because they had a law that said, every, everyone who sees a, a Khoisan person must shoot and kill them, and there will be no uh, penalty for shooting or killing them. So when you do that, then the cattle all then uh, transferred ownership by force. One of the challenges faced when studying South African history and African history in general is a reoccurring problem called erasure. Colonization was not merely an act of violence or theft alone. It was a sophisticated attempt to wipe African history from the records so that Africans, or should we rather say Alcabula Knights, would lose their identity because someone who has lost their identity becomes incapable of claiming their inheritance. This is not to say that every pro-African historic claim is true, but it does suggest that maybe the history we've been receiving needs a little bit more scrutiny. Experience has taught us that history is written by the victors, but common sense dictates that the victors can only come from one side. So by default, that would make our history one-sided. And as Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie has already warned us, there are serious dangers within a single narrative. If Africa had no formal infrastructure, pre-colonialization, then how do we explain the architecture of Timbuktu that predates colonialism by hundreds of years? If gold was only discovered in 1884, then why was there the need to hide the Mapungubia rhino that was gold-plated almost 800 years before gold was in fact discovered? And if Africans never understood large-scale farming, then how do we justify these remains? We do not call out these examples to ignite a back-and-forth debate that can go on and out without an expiration date. We instead want to shed light on the things colonialism sought to keep in the dark. Because we cannot overcome a past that we are too afraid or offended to face. With every war there was fought, you know, the first thing they would go was the cattle, you know. It wasn't, they were not fighting to build factories, you know, they were not fighting to uh, for, to build hotels or, or chalets in, in Zululand or wherever. It was about grazing land for cattle, you know, so... And I, I always make this example that if, 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 I'm an, if I'm an artist and then someone comes and, and steals all my artwork that I've done for 20 years, all the art pieces I've made, and then steals my brushes and my paints, and then locks me in a room and then gives me a guitar and asks me to play a guitar instead. That's really setting me up for failure. All the other methods of creating wealth are foreign to the African. You know, you need trusts and shares and bonds and derivatives and all those things. I'm fortunate to be smart enough to understand them and having been educated and, and whatnot to understand. But 75% of the population in the country don't understand that. So how do you then build a country where you are, you have a choir or a band with a whole lot of, of people who don't know how to play guitar, and you are complaining that they don't know how to play guitar, whereas they just used to playing drums. So for us, was we'll just say, let's give the people the drums. Five years ago, Ntutuko decided that he would play an active role in helping South Africans play the drums they were most accustomed to by creating an investment solution that brings traditional methods of African wealth creation into the 21st century. I've always known that anything that he gets involved in, it's, it's uh, centered around, you know, making things easier. And there's a saying that, uh, you know, simplicity is the highest form of genius. So everything he does, I've always been interested in, um, whether listening on the radio or just reading about him. So when he um, he came out to this idea, uh, yeah, it's Koromo, I got very interested. So the approach, we call it crowd farming. So crowd farming is um, one farm, one manager, many owners of cows in that farm. In the same way as as in, if you have any kids in school, the teacher doesn't teach only his kids. He teaches everyone's kids. We're doing the same thing with cattle. So in this case, um, 
In a farm, you can own three of your cows alongside someone who owns one, alongside someone else who owns 10, but there's one capable farmer who's managing those cattle. So currently, the only way for, the only way for someone to own cattle, if you, if you work in Joburg or in Durban, and you're not living in a farm, or you don't have a farm, is the only way for you to own cattle is if you have an uncle who owns a farm, who's got cattle, that you can say to him, uncle, please can you buy me three cows and keep them in your farm and look after them for me. I will pay you monthly for medicine and looking after them, etc." But now, not everyone has got that uncle. So, Livestock Wealth then is a platform that creates uncles for everyone. There's about 1.2 billion cows on Earth um, and 8 billion people. So it's almost like one cow for every seven people. <clears throat> so um, one thing that one has also learned is that, uh, especially with cattle, uh, they are very much like human beings. You know, in, in fact, if you go on the internet today, you will, you will learn that there's an 80% correlation between the DNA of a cow and the DNA of a human being. Um, that's proven by simple things like, it takes nine months for a cow to be pregnant for it to give a calf. Uh, it takes three weeks uh, for it to, between pregnancy cycles, just like a human being. Um, the, the time it takes to, to wean a calf, where a calf stops drinking milk, is six months uh, for a calf, uh, pretty much the same for a same for for a baby that you can a human being that you can actually start having solids instead of uh, of milk only. We need to change the way our food is produced. Uh, currently, the diet of an entire nation is designed by four supermarkets. We don't know where our meat comes from. We don't know how it's made. Our veggies, we don't know. What pesticides are they using? Um, we don't know. Uh, so there's a lot that it needs to change. Because Africa is such a vast continent, for many millennia communities didn't suffer because of a lack of land. In the year 1900, it is estimated that we only had a population of about 1.4 million people in South Africa, which is basically the size of two Bulukwanes. So you take a population that size, place it on a land mass this big, and as a cattle farmer, you are able to let your cattle roam over thousands of hectares, so the moment an area becomes overgrazed, you simply move your cattle to the next available piece of land. However, over the centuries, times have changed. Populations have grown, and instead of buying our meat at a farm or a butchery, we now go to the grocery store, stores that need a constant supply of meat, which has placed a new pressure on farmers in the 21st century. This constant need for meat has led to what we call feedlots. Although our country has regulations, the simple fact remains that around 90% of the beef we eat is from cattle that are confined to a limited space where they are given hormones and growth stimulants that make them grow at an accelerated pace in order to make it to the shelf as soon as possible. So according to the South African Feedlot Association, cattle will enter a feedlot at a mass of 230 kgs and leave at a mass of 460 kgs in only 120 days. But I think the good thing that, that can happen if we, if we change that is that it will create more opportunities for entrepreneurs in the food business to get an entry into the food business. And that you'll have more people growing chickens and selling them uh, directly to people. Uh, instead of us relying on chickens from the USA. And we don't know how they grew them there. Uh, we're just happy it's cheap, cheap chicken. Um, but it's cheap for now. It's expensive later when people become sick. Despite the fact that he was presenting an idea, a proposal that had the potential to revolutionize livestock farming as we know it, the government did not share his enthusiasm. And they were not willing to back him.
So the the biggest challenges that we've, we've really faced is, is is funding. You know, had we started and only looked for government help when we started off livestock wealth, we will still have not started waiting for for government. Help. And uh, there was three years ago, going from government door to government door, saying um, we want to do this. Uh, 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 business called livestock wealth. Uh, this is what we do. This will help your objectives, etc., etc. But government people have got what they call policies. So if your if your round idea does not fit into their square hole, uh, they really are lost in terms of saying how can we how can we support it. Yet they return billions back to Treasury every year. Now, Ntutuko's problem was a very simple one. He was armed with a good idea, a bit of capital, but he had no farm. This is where Bill comes in. Bill is a farmer, a farmer who has a farm in Blood River. Blood River is next to Freiheit. Freiheit is in KwaZulu Natal. Bill wants to sell his farm. Ntutuko needs a farm, but because he has no government support, he would need to sell an arm, a leg, and at least two good organs in order to afford the farm. So Ntutuko comes up with an idea. Instead of buying, why doesn't he just rent the farm? So then Bill will be able to keep his farm while Ntutuko uses the farm to grow livestock wealth, so that eventually he can buy not just one, but many farms. My name is Bill van Lillyfeld. And uh, my relationship with Livestock Wealth is through Ntutu Ushezi, whom I met some four years ago, uh, when he came to the farm to come and talk to me about the idea that he had and was wanting to put into practice. He apparently heard that there were some farms on the market in this area. Uh, my farm was on the market at the time, and he phoned me for an appointment and uh, we got into a discussion about his idea with forming livestock wealth as a cattle bank, uh, so that people could invest in something that was tangible, rather than putting their money into a bank and not knowing exactly what was happening to it. For, for me, that's, that's very important because we've, we, we used so much to, to the life here, yeah, these virtual things that you can see or touch. Um, somebody tells you that your money is growing and with all the scams that are happening, you might think, you know, you're, you're sorted, you're secure, but you're actually not because somebody is just misrepresenting what, what, uh, what is really happening. Uh, so for me, I love cows because of that, you know, you, you can see, you can go visit, you can verify um, and you can see the growth because it's in the tummy uh, and after a few months it's going to come out and that, that will be a dividend. So the model is simple, it's easy to understand. I can sell it to, I can explain it to, 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 to the eldest of the elder who don't, maybe he might not have the education that I have and they will still be as excited as I am about that opportunity. My name is Calvin Tlagani Pongema. Uh, I'm like the farm manager for Livestock World Fair Play Farm here at Blood River. And I have been involved with uh, Livestock World since the beginning of this year, just after graduating from college. Uh, Livestock World has different investment options. The first one being the cow, the traditional one. So invest in a pregnant cow, that's the first option. The second investment option, which is the winner, which is the 24 months investment option. So invest in a winner, which is seven months old, and then it will grow up until 24 months old. And that time it will be weighing about 450 kgs or somewhere around there. And then we'll take it to an abattoir to get slaughtered. And you're gonna get your returns based on the weight of that winner and the market price of beef at that time. Uh, I've, I've tried to play in the stock market uh, privately myself, but the, the truth is you never know where, where that thing is going. I mean, there's a lot of people who were swearing out by Steinhoff a few years ago, and <laughs> the, 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 the value has been totally wiped out. There's a lot of people who were swearing by uh, Tencent and um, Nespas, and you know, that, 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 that value is tumbling now. 
And it's very difficult to explain to somebody who's put like their life saving in a product to, 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 to tell those, that person that you know, they've lost 90% of their value over a couple of months or a couple of weeks uh, because of accounting irregularities. Uh, people don't understand that language. You know, they just know that they've lost, they've lost money. Um, so I, I like being in, th in an environment where I understand and I can control. Um, and I can go and visit and, and see if I'm in trouble or not, if I'm going to be in trouble or not. If I've, I'm sold a cow that's pregnant and I go and see that the cow has got a flat tummy, then I know I'm in trouble. <laughs> so the concept was basically aimed at landless people, um, urban people, that had grown up with the tradition, the African tradition of owning livestock as a form of wealth. Um, as we all know, one of the savings accounts for future uh, use is livestock within the African community. I've always wanted to own cows. I grew up with my grandmother having cows. So I remember my Koromo. There was a, a definite change in the stability of the family. So for me, the Koromo have always represented the comfort and stability. So I was very eager to get into that. But like I said, I'm a, I'm a CA, I'm, I'm employed, I'm running businesses. I don't, have, um, I don't have time to look after my own cows. So when he started this idea, yeah, Livestock Wealth, I was quite keen from the onset, because for me, the, the, any opportunity to get into cows without necessarily having to worry about, you know, wana molimi or molisa, I mean, and then uh, cows getting sick, giving birth, uh, feeding them, weather, sicknesses, and all those things. I don't have to worry about that. I just pay somebody every month to, to handle all that. And the una model is never predictable or what are you going to get out of that. So from me, um, I always wanted to have that legacy for my children. The greatest human endeavors have arguably not come from a place of human curiosity, but rather a place of human need. We needed light, so we created the light bulb. We needed shelter, so we created the house. Not because early humans thought, how can I make money out of the houses I build? But rather, how can we respond to this need of shelter? In the same way, Ndutuko became an entrepreneur, not because of a simplistic want, but because he was called to respond to a specific personal need. When, when we were growing up, we were, we were a very large family, like we, it was five of us, <clears throat> and mom was a single parent. So, um, um, and the teacher, so teachers didn't get paid lots of money, uh, so, um, As a kid, you never get to really, um, you never get to uh, see your mom's pay slips after deductions, you know. But my mom, she's like me. She never used to like hide things. And like sometimes I would see her pay slip after deductions, and I would see that it's like a pittance, a total pittance after all the the loans that she would have to take and all the other stuff, um, the policies, this, that, that she would, she would have, have taken to, to make a living for us, uh, you would see that uh, really she's not really doing well. Uh, so, so that forced me from a young age to, to never have to ask for money. So I think that's how I, I learned my entrepreneurship. Even when I was in boarding school, so um, I think there was, I was in standard six or standard seven. There was the last time I ever asked for pocket money from home. That's the standard seven. That was the last time. And uh, so at school I would, 
I would, uh, I would go and buy uh, at the at the macro uh, or, or trade center. It was a trade center in, in Spingo, because I went to Mlazi Comprehensive Technical High School. So every Saturday I would go to the trade center, the wholesaler, and I would buy cookies, and and I would uh, take those back to to my room and lock them up in my locker. And every evening I was the cookie merchant, you know, who would walk room by room uh, selling cookies and, uh, and I would always have money. At only 19 years old, life would again test Tuntutuko, giving him but two options, step up to a higher level or fall. Just two weeks before I was supposed to go back to Cape Town, uh, so mom left the house in the morning. She was fine, just complaining of a headache. And then I went to town to buy some stuff. Came back in the afternoon. Uh, then they, someone met us along the way and say, come home quickly, come home quickly. Your mom has passed away. Um, uh, she had a sudden brain hemorrhage and just, uh, just passed away within half an hour. So she like, <clears throat> she like was out in the morning, fine came back in the afternoon, she was, she was gone. Yeah. I don't like to think about my mom. I, I try and not think about it. Yeah, so... Sorry. Being a single parent and me being the oldest, I'm the second oldest, but I had to assume the role of being the oldest now. And then, then I had to assume the role of being a, a breadwinner now for, for these uh, four other siblings of mine while still at university. And uh, uh, I had to work at uh, winding up my mom's estate. I was ex uh, executor of estate when I was 19 years old. Uh, so I had to like, make sure all her debts are paid, people owe her money, uh, bring money, all that stuff. So, and then, and then that all uh, government one was, a, money wasn't a lot either. Uh, so, and then the kids were growing up, my siblings, so I had to make sure that they go into uh, boarding school and uh, are looked after and all that stuff. So, so I had to, use my entrepreneurship as well to make to make this money grow so that it doesn't finish you know so so and one of the things I did at the time was uh, uh, having these arcade video games at UCT where the kids play so <clears throat> it's like there I was really making good money you know okay on a weekly basis I would bank two grand from the coins that the that the students were playing at at UCT because I had I had my games in the various residences. I had about five or so different games. So at the bank, they actually knew me uh, by name. Uh, and uh, every, every week I would come in, they would know me. Like Friday afternoon, two o'clock, she is coming in with like 2,000 rands worth of coins. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I would come in and count all of them and, uh, and, and then uh, put it in my bank. In fact, in fact, the bank actually gave me a credit card I had a credit card at 19. I was the only, I was the only uh, a guy in rest with a credit card. So people, when people wanted to hire cars, they would come to me and, and I would charge them because I had a credit card. Whatever you have an experience, you always want to, to experience it, you know. There's always that curiosity about what you have an experience, you know. So for me, I was, I was, uh, I was like, okay, I need to go work, I need to go study, work in a corporate environment, and, and climb the corporate ladder. Ntutuko's knack for creating wealth 
would again materialize with the purchase of his first home in Parktown, Johannesburg. So, I, so this beautiful flat, you know, like the bedroom was, just, you, could fit, you could fit three double beds in the, in the bedroom there. Uh, and uh, and but within the bathroom, this guy had like, uh, he, had, he had a carpet in the bathroom even. And there was cockroaches everywhere. <laughs> so I, like, I picked it up for like 140,000 rand. That's how much I, I had paid for it. So like, my bond was like 2,000 rand a month, you know, earning like a huge amount of money a uh, month. So I had all this money lying around. It was a 24-year-old, which was fun. Um, then I sat on this property for two years, cleaned it up very nicely. And two years later, I sold it for 450,000 rand. And uh, today, the same flats are selling for about close to a million. Uh, the same flats I had bought for with, with cockroaches everywhere. Uh, yeah, so it was, a, it, was, it was the first big transaction that I did where I like, made quite a lot of money, you know, which was good. Maybe had I just stuck to that. <laughs> I could be a billionaire by now. <laughs> After spending five years working for a corporation, Shezi decided the time had come for a change in scenery. So he applied to one of the world's largest consulting firms and eventually made it to the final round of interviews. My interview didn't go well, you know, like, uh, I, I think, uh, yeah, it didn't go well. I think they had some really difficult case questions and then I had to, well, one had to fix, like, on the fly. So after the incident, when they called me the afternoon and said, uh, sorry, Shiz, we're not going to offer you a position, blah, blah, blah. I was like, okay, uh, I'm done with corporate now. Uh, I'm done. Uh, I'm not going to apply for any other job. Uh, this, is the last, this is the last employer that I have and no other one. What I've always known about Shiz is, is uh, he's always trying new, innovative ways of doing things, um, like the airport uh, business where he, you drop off your car and he goes and he's got a panel beating service in the, at the airport. So while you fly, you drop off your car and he does that. When you come back, you pick it up. Always like doing things that have not been done, you know, like things that are not there, you know, like things that are exciting. We were the first sort of in the country, the first sort of, uh, I'll call it light scale, uh, mobile panel beating business that, that really went to people's homes and office blocks and fixed cars uh, for people in there in the yard and we had done some really cool branding you know, on, on this wearing nice uniforms and, and people would think, oh, is this a franchise? I said, no, we started from scratch. Excuse the pun. <laughs> However, starting a new company in our current South African climate can come with challenges from unexpected sources. Most people who are spray painters were reluctant to come and work for two black guys with a bucky. Uh, even though we were offering them double what they were earning and shareholding in the business. You know, they were very happy earning peanuts as long as the boss is white. Um, in fact, there was this one guy, we offered him 20% equity in the business. And to this day, he earns 8,000 rand a month, uh, 12 years later. So we used to get him on weekends only, you know, so we would always, when people call during the week, we would like, we would answer the phone and say, um, uh, Scratch Mobile, hello? And the other person will say, I want, I want a car done, blah, blah, blah. When can you come? And they will page, will page like a two-quire notebook loudly. No, we, we're fully booked this week. Fully booked, ma'am, fully booked, sorry. Uh, but I've just had a cancellation for Saturday morning. <laughs> will Saturday morning work? And then say, yeah, Saturday morning is fine. Good. Then on Saturday, we'll drive to, to, to the hostel in um, Zimtlope in Soweto go pick up the guy and drive to Sensen <laughs> and then put him in our uniform. <laughs> and then we go there, spray a car, and in two hours we are done, and then uh, and off we go, take, take the credit card payment, and then we'll pay him his due. And then eventually, a few months later, that uh, people started saying, OK, yeah, we'll consider working for these guys, because at least you know they could see we're moving. I think one of the things is that uh, I implement a, I shouldn't say patient in never now. We implement her idea. How of you push out the boundary, how of you eat as we to the next as I treat on the moment. And at the core of Zunai, the Chinga Shot, work also the solution. I work on the solution for the problems and Ravadans. 
and problems are Africa. So as you know, in a problem, we have a growing middle class. I call the investment solution who they are. You know, in the first instance, livestock farming is a secondary operation. What you're doing is you're actually farming with grass. So your grass management is priority number one because without the grass and sufficient grass, you don't have place for the cattle. And another thing that you have to invest in is water, which is your important source. You cannot farm without water. You know, you're, um, on average, your cow will drink about 40 liters of water. So if you've got 100 cows, that's a lot of water. I think that's 4,000 liters of water on average a day. And in summer, it will go up to, in summer, it will go up to maybe 5,000 on average a day. So you've got to have plenty of water. And you want productive cattle. You want cattle that are going to calve every year and wean a calf so that you can then turn that animal into cash or reinvest it in further livestock. And for, for me, that's the core of who we are, because Koromo doesn't represent um, a, a suitcase. Koromo has always been in a crawl and in a community and in in symbolic terms, it's always been in a secular shape. And uh, there's an importance in a secular shape. It, 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 it invokes feelings of community, where everybody is, uh, is equal and everybody's the same. And for me, the idea and the identity are Koromo, and symbolism are Koromo. If you, I mean, you can even go deep into when we have functions and how you, know, you can never have a big function without slaughtering a cow. Um, whether you believe in the ancestral part of it or not, um, it's still a core of our, our culture. And I think that's going to separate Africa from, from, from the cow um, and from you know, using cows as an intergenerational wealth tool. And that, for me, that's what it represents. If African culture encourages us to embrace Ubuntu, then bad Ubuntu should also impact the way we treat our animals. Since historically, we have lived in harmony with nature, and what is nature without the animals in it? Um, the way we, we treat animals here around the farm, basically we let them free range, range free on, on, the, on the felt out there. So they just graze freely. We do not control grazing as such, but we just put them in camps and they'll roam around the camp uh, and graze. He gave us some education around grass feeding, um, and we, we realized that is, you know, the best way to, to feed a cow is through grass, and that's what he's doing. So I've got that sense of comfort that we've got the right person leading this, and it's not just about profit. At our farms, uh, we have to make sure that uh, cows graze freely, and um, not confined where they are unable to move. Uh, hence, uh, even as we move into the beef supply side, our obsession with free range uh, beef where cows are allowed to grow naturally. I think there's a great future for livestock growth. But the limiting factor on the growth of livestock growth is land. and the track record and what Shazi has achieved um, and with various awards, etc., are indicative of the concept being very successful. It's a proven concept. And I think a lot more people, even from um, the, the, the white side, they understand that it's important for, for the Africans to get the, the land that they, they believe is theirs back. Um, and I think it's important to, 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 to tell everybody in the country how and what does it mean um, for everybody who would have been uh, from another uh, line of uh, uh, descendants, uh, not, Af not necessarily African. I think we need to be bold in this discussion. I think we need to, uh, to, to give direction. 
But at the end of the day, I don't think we can avoid the topic any longer. We've, we've tried to push it under the carpet for long enough, but you know, it's, 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 sooner or later it's going to rear its head. So it's either you take control of the conversation or you, you let it go un, uncontrolled and you don't know what the consequence of that will be. The limiting factor is land. And one of the things that we need is land that must remain productive. And in this way, land can be distributed to those that don't have land by being involved in livestock growth. And it's not to say that in the future, the same investors can't become shareholders in that land that's being utilized. That's another value added um, item that is going to be developed in the future. And I think the people who are handling the debate now need to show a little bit more leadership um, when it comes to the issue of land. We, we need to know exactly what is the proposal, what are, what are we talking about. Yes, there were, the, the, the were, there were sessions where people were called in to, to, to give their opinions, um, but we need to understand that the, those are still a, a small portion of the opinions that we have. Um, the, the timing was limited and people interactions were limited. We all have an opinion. Um, all of those opinions are important, but at the end of the day, we need to, we need to have leadership. And I think that's the one thing that we, uh, the, the governing party particularly needs to show more of. Ushezi, umuntu ngushia ngi miyaga, ngi ti miyaga u 18. Yes, because ngu umuntu o na 24 manje. Uh, but uh, I've worked under Ushezi uh, for, for two years. So, so go on ke lo is through Ushezi. Ngimbu anje ngente ini ngi gmen. Uputi, ngashu futi gutu baba. Unkombise i part, I believe most abanta bayazi. Uputi, unapila, ngapanje, uputi, usebenze ngapanze go mundu. Ngibona one day, and we partnership no shares. Uh, and 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 kuna ma plans already assessing now uh, moving forward with Sivule see si, see si, si expand looking bona man which is a small spaza shop and it's not only this uh wunye uh besides the spaza shop. If you bonga uh congo sneako nekai so, so um, then, um, then, you are a, 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 you are a team. I, I would, I would love to, to be remembered for, um, for, for, for being able to, let's do it to Bulamazol. Bulamazol is uh, early in the morning and the grass is still wet. You're going to school and you're, you, you nicely ironed grey pants but the grass is still wet from all the dew from yesterday. Now, <clears throat> the person who wakes up first and walks the trail where there's still the, the dew, their pants get wet. Um, and the last guy walks, arrives at school with, his, with, with no issues, his pants are dry. Uh, it doesn't look like he was walking through any difficulty. Yeah, so, so for me, I, 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 I would like to I would love to have made the path easier for the next guy. Even if he failed, but maybe the next guy can try to do a different method and win. But like, you no, know, from, the, from the few steps I've walked, then that pe the next person can walk 10, you know? Um, so I think for me, that's, that's what I would like uh, um, to be engraved on my uh, gravestone. Uh, the guy will give it a shot, you know? <laughs> yeah. The year is 2018. The country is South Africa. And at only 24 years old, she has reached a turning point. The issue of land has risen into the public discourse where her people have agreed and disagreed, and in a few rare occasions, agreed to disagree. The fact that her past is so interwoven with her present has placed her future in jeopardy. How do we solve for X if you are unwilling to sit down with Y? Here's a theory, and it's called the theory 
of effort. To colonize takes effort. Apartheid took effort. Effort to wake up at the crack of dawn, drink coffee, a piece of toast, perhaps eggs as well, then drive off to work to connive. Connive against human rights, creatively coming up with ways to discriminate through laws that take you days and months and years to construct, and then amend, and then polished, and that is called effort. And then once those laws were passed, you needed to find people who would enforce those laws for you. And once you found those people who would enforce those laws for you, you would need to employ them and then pay them a living wage so that they too could wake up at the crack of dawn, enjoy a cup of coffee, toast, and perhaps eggs as well. Effort. Then when the day comes that those laws are eventually broken, you need to race back to the drawing board to create counter laws to counter the resistance to those laws that you had created that were eventually broken. More effort. So the question now becomes, if it took this much effort to construct South Africa's history, what makes us think it will take us so much less effort to deconstruct it? Why have we placed the burden of uniting a country 400 years divided on a Rugby World Cup? Speaking of unity as if it's just a punchline best delivered by beer adverts. At 24 years old, we will not grow any older if we refuse to grow up. If we refuse to wake up to the fact that being a South African is not just a right, but a privilege bestowed on but 56 million people in this world, a privilege that is burdened with the responsibility of effort. Effort to respect those you disagree with. Effort to resist the temptation to dehumanize each other based on race, culture, gender, or gender identity. Effort to acknowledge, respect, and learn from the other side of history that has been so long excluded from our public discourse. Having civil conversations about land and ownership is not easy. We are a country of many different races, cultures, and life experiences. But if we can accept that it is effort that brought us here, then we can begin to realize that effort will be needed to bring us out. The theory of effort. This is Made in Africa. And today, we shall make effort.